All right, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or evening, depending if you're watching this on my YouTube channel later. We are looking at the stage two skills in the Distinguished Educator Program. Now, last week, I offered a session called the CPS Distinguished Educator Deep Dive. And I've actually just added this slide to the top because what we're going to focus on um, shifts a little bit. We are actually going to take a look back at that later, but we want to look at the skills themselves. So we are going to talk about I can statements versus practice statements. We're going to talk about unpacking the practice statements and category, categorizing those by pedagogy, content, technology, and relationships. If you've not yet submitted your stage two evidence, this is going to be a really helpful exercise for you to go through this um, in this session. We are going to take a look back at the CPS Distinguished Educator Deeper Dive because I very quickly shared these resources of what TPAC, um, ISTE, uh, our Schoology platform, and this collective expertise. I won't go into the detail of what I shared last time, but I just want to have the resources ready for you because I think understanding these, um, and actually for this, I'm going to add a more important one to the top. Because we're, um, we're looking at the stage two skills, I want to look at our curriculum um, content. Um, which we are going to address in this content point up here, but I want to explicitly look at some of that, which we didn't do in the deeper dive. So I just went ahead and added this slide so that you've got the agenda from the deeper dive as well. Um, another uh, thing that I've decided to add is um, at the end of it, I'm going to put a um, link to YouTube recording. And so this obviously won't be available until, um, until it gets published. But I do just want to show you that that link, when I add that in there later, if you've gotten a copy of this agenda, when I publish it, I'll add that link right away so you've got everything in one place. I'm always trying to make everything as easily accessible as possible for all of you. I'm going to drop the agenda now. And then we're going to get started on the content of the agenda. All right. So, and let me make this just a little bigger for you to be able to view, because I don't need to edit it. Okay, so the first thing that we're looking at is in the agenda that I can statements versus the practice statements. So I'm gonna navigate with you now. I'm going to, uh, I would normally recommend you launch Clever. I'm signed in as a district admin, so I am gonna bypass that. But I do recommend that everyone is signed in to the Chrome browser. If you're using Safari, or um, Edge or Explorer or Firefox, I recommend you switch over to Chrome um, for this type of work and that you are signed in and sync is turned on. If you need tips for how to do that, I have a quick five minute tidbit video that walks you through that as well as accessing your apps in Clever. But for now, I'm just gonna go to schoology.cps-k12.org because I'm signed in and syncing, it's, it's already auto-saved. Because I'm signed in and syncing, I did not have to sign in. It's taking me straight in. Sometimes you'll have to click on your username. Um, but we are in the Schoology um, platform. Now, I can really quickly just scroll down and I can see um, an update from, actually, there's quite a few. I'm loving how much this is starting to be used. But I can see right here that Emily Campbell posted the Office of Curriculum Instruction, an update right there. So when you are scrolling, if you happen to see an update to the course, you can actually just click on the name of the course right there and that'll take you straight in. I'm gonna go up here to courses and select Office of Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, if you're having any trouble navigating to that, in my stage one support tidbit videos, I've got how to navigate to this, how to reorder your courses if you need to. So uh, if you need help getting an easier navigation into this program, I can help you with those resources during the Q&A time. All right, now I'm in the Office of Curriculum and Instruction course. I'm gonna go down to that green folder, CPS Distinguished Educator Program. I'm actually gonna open a couple of versions of this because I wanna, there's a few tabs that the load time takes a while. So I wanna preload these. This is a great tip for you if you are presenting information to your students. Um, when you are recording sessions or you're meeting them with, with them in a Google Meet, it's great to preload some of the content that you'll need to refer to. All right, actually that should do it. Okay, 
So what I want to do is I want to look at number one, the I can statements versus the practice statement. And here I'll even add it to the agenda. Hint, stage one versus two. We're going to stay focused today on the practice statements, but I wanted to start with that compare and contrast. So when we are looking at, um, in stage one, it was in your self-assessment page, step two. If you look there, we actually added a link to those I can statements. And then in stage two, uh, and please remember, you're not going to be able to hop around the way I'm doing. Um, this does have completion rules, so you have to follow all of the content in the order that it's published. Um, there are completion rules set. But I'm going to hop into the post, post self assessment. And actually, I, I'm not. Sorry. Where is it? Professional development. Okay, so I'm in step three of that. Uh, we linked it in more than one place in stage two, but the stage two practice statements are right there. So what I'm going to do is side by side these, and on agenda point number one, we're going to look at I can versus practice statements. And I'm going to provide some clarity on these skills for stage two. So in stage one, the self-assessment were I can indicators, meaning that you have the ability to, the skills and knowledge to be able to do this. You may have not done it yet, but you know how to do it. Or you may have done it in the context of professional learning or professional co collaboration. Your school may have a Schoology course where your principal communicates, and so you've interacted in there. Or you may have participated in updates with your curriculum teams, Math and Me, ELA headquarters. But maybe you haven't done these in your instructional practices. Well, stage one is all about that you can do it, and you don't have to demonstrate that um, you do all those things, just that you have the skills and knowledge that you can do that. So the I can statements are written that way intentionally. And you want to remember that to achieve your stage one, you just need to be able to do these. You don't have to put, put them into practice yet. Stage two takes a rather significant shift from I can statements to practice statements. And I can do this indicates you already do this in your practices. Let's pause on that word already. Going back here, when I'm talking about stage one versus two and practice statements, um, you really wanna highlight that word. Um, if you've downloaded your own version of this uh, or you're marking it up, I do know some people are using read and write um, PDF writer. You may wanna annotate this, um, but that really is an important word for stage two statements as we're unpacking these statements. You already do this in your practices. Well, if you don't already do it, you might still be at more of a stage one level with that statement. That you can do it, but you can do it like with a user guide open next to you. Or you can do it in the context of, you know, we team teach this content or this subject, and my partner's really good at doing this, and I've copied over her materials or his materials. So I can do this with some support. It's a completely valid response. But it's a big um, clarification that I wanted to make in this session on stage two skills. So again, stage two statements are shifting from I can statements to practice statements. And if you are saying you do this, that means you already do it in your practices. If you know how to do it and you haven't put it into practice, we'll talk a little bit today about where and what you can do to make sure you, you can make this statement um, you already do this in your practice. Now, I can't do this yet is a completely valid response. There's lots of things in stage two um, that you may have never had to do before. A lot of people didn't have to do them until COVID. And then, of course, there was such a steep learning curve with this being a drastic shift that even the most well-intentioned teacher who wanted to implement online learning just didn't have the skills yet to be able to do this. So I can't do this yet is not um, a statement that... Uh, let me, let me rephrase. Whatever is true for you in your current practices is the right answer to this self-assessment, okay? So wherever you are, it is a self-diagnostic tool. It's to put you on the path to identifying whether or not you do these currently in your practices or whether or not you need to reference materials and practice it, put it into practice, and then you'll be able to, in a subsequent, in the... Um, in the post-assessment, then you'll be able to shift to I do this. All right. 
Uh, going back to the agenda, so I compared and contrasted the stage one statements versus stage two statements. Stage one were I can, stage two are practice statements I currently do. So I kind of, I touched on this a little bit, unpacking the statements, but I'm actually going to go through each category with you next to talk about the way the statements are organized um, and the categorization uh, activity that you will do in your submission of evidence. So if anybody in this session has already been with me for a deeper dive, even if you haven't started your submission of evidence, you've gotten a little preview of what that evidence looks like. Um, this categorization, categorization step um, is really important for your reflection um, as, you, as you go through the process of saying, I do put these into practice. Um, we want you to be able to categorize them with these um, four critical areas. And I introduced that a little bit in my video on the stage two distinguished educator. All right, so we are going to unpack some statements uh, using categorizing. I, I just got a lot of stuff though, and I wanna make sure, um, is there anybody in the group who's not yet uh, taken a dive into stage two, but you're just kind of getting a preview? You can call that out. Um, you know, why don't, why don't we each just say where you are in the process? like? I'm in stage two, um, I'm doing this as a preview, um, maybe you're just doing this out of curiosity, but write your statement here. So my statement is, I'm providing this for clarity. So that's what I'm gonna write. If you could each write into the chat, you know, I haven't started yet, maybe I'm previewing, or I'm in the middle of it. And if there's anybody in here who finished stage two, I'd love to know if you finished and you just joined in for some additional information. All right, Lori's currently in the stage two self-assessment. Okay. Lori, can I clarify, are you in the pre-assessment at the beginning or the post-assessment where you're reviewing after some PD? I'm gonna open that up in, nope, not this one. Um, I'm actually, I completed the pre-assessment, so like right before the post-assessment. Okay, great. So then the part that you are in, you've completed the pre-assessment, step two, and you're in step three. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, and I, pr I probably ought to keep that up as a, a good list to reference. So there are um, only five required sort of um, steps in this. The rest all becomes op uh, optional. Um, I hope you all want to download your badge. Um, there's a little part of me that I will um, superficially admit that I can't wait to get my stage two badge. I've got like a couple of skills that I'm, I cannot say I put into practice yet. Um, and then if there's anybody in the audience who is in my boat, where I don't have students in a classroom, I have to do everything in the context of teachers being my students. So some of this stuff I'm going to have to do in a different sort of way. So that's why I can't achieve my stage two just yet, because I have to put myself into... I have to look at it differently. Um, by the way, uh, there was some talk from our Director of Curriculum Instruction, Emily Campbell, with some statements that were added in light of administrators or maybe different roles. So if you're in this PD this afternoon and you're in a similar boat to me, um, I can't submit evidence yet because I'm not there yet with being able to say I put into practice everything in, this, uh, in these statements. Okay, so Sienna's currently in stage two, I can or currently do some items, but there were a few things I was not familiar with. Perfect. Um, I don't know about you either, but for me, I think that this program, um, the self-reflective piece is really important. And so I think if we make sure we kind of step away from feeling like, well, I just, I wanna achieve it. I've got to get to the end of this, to like slowing down and looking at, well, what do I need to work on to to not just have the head knowledge, I know how to do that, but really make it part of my practices. Um, that's the part that challenges me in stage two. So I like that part of the program. All right, let's unpack some of these statements. Let me have, hop back on the agenda. And now what we're gonna do is go um, area by area of administrative um, communication, uh, assessment and instruction areas. And then we're gonna look at the category categorization, why am I struggling with that word today? We're gonna to look at categorizing those statements. And um, if you were in my deeper dive, I gave you a little bit of a preview into the back end, like our teams work on categorizing those. 
I will say there are some that are really straightforward and there is just like this statement matches these three categories and not the fourth. There's other that I think are interpretive. So, um, so really, uh, that's why that piece of the assessment is designed as a reflective exercise. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. So let's unpack the practice statements now. And for this, uh, I am going to um, just let you know if you would like um, to get to the stage two self-assessment practice indicators, you are going to need to complete stage one. Um, and this is designed very intentionally for that. Oh, shoot, I didn't really close that tab. It's gonna take a minute to load now. I shouldn't have went out of order. Here we go. In stage one, you're going to have to finish the stage one program. And then you do have to do this stage one refresher to unlock stage two. Um, that's going to be regardless of, you know, even if you have your badge, you have that little activity or exercise just to demonstrate a posted update. Um, but it, it's the activity that is um, required to unlock the stage two folder. Because if you're not in stage two yet, I'm not actually going to drop the link to the statements because we want you very intentionally focused on the stage that you are in. Um, this is not a, a goal to rush through this. So as soon as you unlock stage two, you will be able to get to the practice statements right when you do the pre-assessment. All right, Does it, is there anybody, since we have such a small group, I feel like I can take more Okay, Marie, mid stage two, great. I feel like I can take more personal questions on this, um, but is there anybody in today's conversation who um, who is who is not to not through stage one yet? I figured naming it stage two skills, we'd probably get everybody who finished stage one. Good. Okay. Just go ahead and call it out if you're not there, because I don't want to speak past what you're doing. All right, so I'm assuming everybody's at least into this part of the folder where you can view the introduction, watch the video, and then a lot of what I just shared is, is clarified that in that really quickly too. When you watch the video, you do get a preview of all the things I'm showing you. So as soon as you take the pre-assessment uh, pre for stage two, let me put it in preview mode so it looks a little more like what you're doing. Um, you'll have taken that form. That form emailed you your results. Um, so whatever you answered, whatever you categorize as, you know, I can do this, but with support or I can't do this yet, you've got those results sent to your email box. So, um, I would, you know, download or copy those. Um, one suggestion that I have, if you're making this sort of like a, a working document for your professional development, I might copy the results and paste them in a Google doc, um, and annotate underneath them, like what I need to do to work on it. Um, but if anybody wants any guidance on ideas for managing your work through stage two, I'd be happy to share that as well. All right. Uh, so if you're not to um, this list yet, it's coming. Finish your pre-assessment. Let me get out of this preview. Once you finish your pre-assessment, you'll have all those statements in your email box. And then number three, that opens up once your pre-assessment is done. And then you can view um, the stage two practice statement. So you'll get this link. All right. I've been tempted to just share it with people, but we're really trying to make it part of the process of completing the program. So you will get this when you are on step three. All right. So let's look at the statements. And first, in unpacking them, I'm going to talk to you about the four areas, which are administrative, communication and connection, assessment practices, and instructional practices. All right, each of the statements under those, um, there is some overlap, but we, we wanted to categorize them because there are different things that you need to do. And in the background of this program, when we were, when we were working on developing it, we were looking at things that the teacher has to do, things students are doing, but then we also looked at, well, what does the teacher have to do that's more an administrative function of your job? Like for example, when we were back in the face-to-face -face classroom, I had to have posted on my board every day our objectives for the day. Uh, it had to be written in ICANN language, and um, there were certain things I had to have posted. How does that translate into a blended or digital space? So that's more of your administrative. Those are the things I have to do to connect my, my world of work tasks in this digital world. Um, the first statement in here is if I want, if an application I want to use 
is not on the CPS approved software list, I can complete the application for technology initiative. You'll often hear this referred to as the ATI process in the district. You guys are brilliant and um, talented and amazing educators who bring amazing experiences to your students. In a district like ours that has the level of support um, the IT that we do and our systems, we do have to follow um, approved software usage because we have to make sure that we are following um, best practices for our students to be safe. And so sometimes the application has to be evaluated for its use of student data. We have to make sure that that item is also safe for our network, that we aren't pulling in something that's going to um, open a back door for something that might hack or take over our, our network. And so we have a whole team of people who are much smarter than me uh, in both legal as well as IT and infrastructure um, who look at the applications that we want to use as educators and make sure that they're safe for everybody to use. So a lot of times I think I've heard people sort of explain like they're frustrated with the ATI process. Um, the only thing I can say is, as somebody who has worked in the IT department for nearly 40 years now, I've come to really respect the process because of the importance, keeping our students safe, keeping their data protected, and keeping our network safe. Some of you might recall last year, um, Hughes High School got completely shut down off the network and they weren't able to access the internet for a long time. Um, and it is because a virus got in. Um, and so, so there's, there's very good reason for these statements being in here. But now if I'm unpacking the statement, if an application I want to use is not on the CPS approved software list, I can complete the uh, application for technology initiative. So you've got to have some knowledge here, right? How to access the application for technology? How do I find out if it's approved already? Um, but how do I also make a decision that I want to use it? I would say that this statement is pretty much a straightforward um, technology statement. And for most people, there's, there's a few people who submitted that one as their administrative evidence. You could do that. I'll be really honest with you. I wouldn't want to do that. I'd want one of the beefier ones. Um, if I decide I wanted to use BrainPop, for example, uh, because it's going, they've got a great lesson on maps um, and using a map, and it, I'm teaching second grade and we're learning about maps, I want to use brain pop so I just need to go and see if it's approved by the district yes it is I can use it but let's pretend there's some other tool that does child um, map skills really really well you know yes do I have the professional knowledge and expertise to evaluate that and think it looks good instructionally sure but I still have to take that step to make sure that it's approved to make sure that it's safe for our students with their data and make sure it doesn't hurt our network so um, if somebody was to select pedagogy for this, I could kind of see that because I'm making an instructional decision. Um, the statement says, if an application I want to use is not on the approved software list, what do I want to use it for? I can honestly tell you, if you guys categorize this, if you choose to submit your evidence on this one, marking that as technology only would certainly be more than okay. That's a technology statement. If it had said something like, if an application I want to use, for reading um, improvement is not on the CPS approved software list, then I'd be like, okay, that's a content um, statement because it gets into reading content. So that's sort of like uh, a, a really easy look at a pretty straightforward statement. This statement under administrative practices falls under the category of technology. So if you are into your stage two um, submission of evidence, I will open the template. So for those of you in like step two, three, or four, um, I did already share this during the deeper dive and I even share it in my five minute intro, but we will look at this uh, template for submission of evidence. Now, whenever I present on this, let me quickly make a copy because this is the actual template. All right. All right, so what you can see in here is administrative practice statements and then communication assessment and instructional. There's a drop down menu beside the area. So I can click on this drop down menu, and if I wanted to, I could select this one. Um, there's nothing wrong with selecting this one. I feel like the next statements in this one are a little bit meatier for me being an, uh, an educator. 
So um, this would really apply to anybody in any role in the district. But then when I get into statement number two, I use a screen reader like Read and Write to support student needs and learning styles. That is a meaty statement. We're going to unpack that statement now. I'm going to select that one here. Okay, so I'm imagining flash forward that you're in the evidence submission. And let's first go through and on the agenda, it says we are going to categorize them. So I'm going to use that template. Um, and I'm going to get back to why relationships is in all caps in a moment. All right, what you'll actually notice is in the submission of evidence, relationships is listed as the top category. Now, um, in the deeper dive that we took last week, uh, we talked about this being built around the ISTE certification, um, around the TPAC model, um, and uh, the SAMR model. And we looked at some, some of those models um, of technology learning or blended learning. But one thing that we found with that was categorizing things by technology, pedagogy, or curriculum content really overlooked what we knew was the most important and critical um, aspect of our work as educators is to establish those relationships. Relationships between myself and my students, that we make a personal connection, that they know that their life matters in learning and that their lives are reflected in what they're learning. Relationships with our families, making sure that those who support our students at home, that we have a strong relationship. We also wanted to look at the relationship even among the content. So we're looking at the learner engaging with the content and being able to relate that. And what it really all came down to, and I'm, I'm just gonna call her out on this PD, we're in a small group, but um, Dawn Williams, our math manager, we were deep into the work of stage two, and she said, where is the heart in all of this work? And we really realized that if we didn't explicitly call out relationship building as a critical um, component of this work, that we would be completely missing the mark. We can develop the best online content possible, but if we are not making relationships with our students, or if we're not making um, this connection relevant to their lives, then, then we've missed the mark. So let's go back to the actual statement. Under administration, I use a screen reader. Okay, right away in unpacking this, I can say that's a technology skill. Like read and write to support student needs and learning styles. Well, if we're talking about learning styles and student needs, if we're talking about the practices of teaching and learning, that's pedagogy. So I'm going to check that box. Now, this is where it becomes a little bit more interpretive. This is a curriculum content statement. You know, since we're a small group, there's only six of you in here with me. Um, I would love to go a little bit off what I usually do and welcome you to unmute your microphone. And let's talk about this statement. Is this a curriculum content statement? Are relationships implied in this statement? Anybody who feels um, up for having this discussion, go ahead and unmute, and we'll just have a quick discussion around this. Remember, Control D will also unmute you. I can talk a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Oh, no, problem. no problem. I was going to say, um, it's a difficult, yeah, I, just thinking about it, I do think a piece of it is that relationship piece. I think knowing your students um, and knowing their learning styles and knowing and having them know that their voice is heard and um, how they learn best is part of that relationship building. Yeah, you definitely uh, gave me chills when you use the words, um, their voice is heard. Like, I literally actually got goosebumps because you're so, uh, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I think that's, that's insightful and so important. So I'm going to mark relationships. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Because that was golden. No, that was good. Thanks. Oh, good. All right. Um, anyone else want to add, do you see a need for marking curriculum content or not marking it?
All right, I feel like this is subjective here, whether or not this is curriculum content. If I'm a reading teacher and my goal is explicitly teaching reading content, um, a tool like Read and Write is probably gonna be an essential um, item that I use all the time. I would challenge every educator across every subject area and every grade level to consider Read and Write as a great um, universal design for learning um, tool that empowers learners of every age, stage, and ability um, so it becomes a little bit more generalized then. To me, it's definitely a pedagogical tool. Um, it, it's part of our teaching pedagogy. I think that Laurie was completely spot on about the relationship aspect of the statement. And so if I'm submitting my evidence, uh, I might check this, I might not. Remember, um, and when you get to that stage um, of submitting, it is noted that that is a reflective exercise. A reflective exercise. So it's this one here um, in the instructions, categorize the statement. This is a reflective exercise. So you check all that apply, but know that as, as our teams in curriculum and instruction and learning technologies, as we're evaluating your evidence, we're not like, oh no, they didn't get curriculum content on this one, mark them down a point. No, if you actually look back at the rubric, it states for categories marked, that the evidence submitted um, reflects more, more, all or most of the areas checked in the template. So what does that mean? That means that if you mark it as relationships, that you demonstrate that in here. So that may require me to have a two-piece response in my evidence. I may put a link to something, but I may annotate that link um, with either, I might type some text, like, you know, this, this evidence demonstrates relationships by, um, and the, the and, tech, and pedagogy by, and you know the tech, the, the link is here, and that's kind of the, that's the no-brainer one, right? If you post a link to your evidence, the technology kind of speaks to itself. But you may want to support your evidence with a statement. You'll notice that this submission box is a freeform box. You can type into it, so I can type um, my explanation. And then I can um, add a link as well. So let's say I type my explanation, here is my link. And then I can just copy and paste. I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy a bad link. But just whatever my link is that I'm copying, here is my link, paste, okay. And I can move on. So if this is a free form text box. Um, it does say that you can add a screenshot. I would organize my screenshots in a Google file and I would share that file rather than try to paste that screenshot into that little box. That's my recommendation. But I don't want to veer too much into um, the work of submitting the evidence. I want to stay focused on unpacking these statements. And we actually only unpacked one of them. But that's what, I, uh, that's what we want you to sort of, th these are the professional reflections and um, the sort of mental exercise we'd like to see you going through as you're working on your submission of evidence. Um, if you've got this thing like, I'm hoping to have this done by next week weekend and I'm gonna get all my evidence done in one day, I would just encourage you to slow down and, um, and try to um, enjoy the process more um, because at the end of the day when we evaluate it, if it matches the rubric, you will move on. But if you just sort of got it done and you didn't really digest like what um, this statement is about and why, then you've really only just kind of um, missed an opportunity for yourself. So, um, so by all means, if you are just an achiever who wants to get her done, um, go for it. But I would encourage you to, to take your time and reflect. It is also why, and I will just note this, that it is clearly expressed in the, and I know that these, um, the instructions are long here. This seems very wordy. Um, I've had this combed over, not I, our team has combed over these instructions quite a bit. Um, and it's hard to leave off any bit of it. But I will say this, um, your submission indicates that you currently put into practice all statements from stage two. You should be able to demonstrate, I do this, and you'll submit evidence in one of each of the four areas. So we are not saying that you only need to be able to do one of each of the four. You do them all, and you're demonstrating evidence in, of, in one of each. But it also says, please note, the submission of evidence opens up after 80% is achieved on the post-assessment. It opens up. But you should really keep working until you have got 
100% of these into your practices. Why? Not for perfection and not because somebody is holding their feet to the fire, but we really feel that every one of these statements is important in the work of an educator, um, working with students in a blended environment to ensure the, um, the equity of students being able to access learning in any context provided. So, so obviously we're focused on the online world in this. Um, so let's look at the next category now. Uh, obviously with the amount of depth we went into, we're not gonna do every one of the administrative ones. Um, I will say if you need help with like enhancing images on Schoology with resizing and things like that, we've had, I think there's one in my PD um, recordings already on YouTube, um, but these different specific ones, you can get access to any kind of guides that you need. Um, if you feel like you can't find what you need based on what we've got published on our Tech Talk course or our CNI um, course and it links out to their schedule or Sorry, it's, it's actually a Google Calendar. If you can't find what you need, do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us um, on learning technologies or curriculum managers and say, I'm having trouble finding PD support on Read and Write or on PowerSchool and Schoology Sync. We have it and we will make sure that we deliver it to you directly. Personally, if you wanna reach out to me, please Google chat message me. I'm gonna move on to the next area, which is communication and connection statements. There are 10 statements in this. And we know that connecting and communicating with our students and families and one another as professionals is critical in our work. So it was, this list was originally over 20 long. It took a lot of, um, it took a lot of work on our, on our team's part to get it down to what we felt like were you know, a top 10. And we tried not to go over 10 in any area. Um, but you can see there's a, a ton of information here. We're gonna unpack one of them right now. So under communication and connection uh, statements. Um, and I cannot zoom this one in the same way. It interferes with my mute or my, my meet. So I'll zoom this one. I think I have this as big as it'll go. Yeah. All right. So let's, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to call on whoever wants to unmute your microphone. Pick a number, any number, and we're going to unpack that statement. One through ten. Somebody unmute and say a number. Note about me, the smaller the group, the more interaction I'm gonna expect. 10. 10, all right, thank you. I really wasn't gonna move on until somebody said a number. I am able to guide students in checking their learning using PowerSchool and Schoology Gradebook. All right, so I am going to drop down menu that, and I'm gonna pick item number 10, and let's categorize that. So I'm able to guide students in checking their learning using PowerSchool and Schoology Gradebook. Okay, guys, forgive me for being the IT employee, but I immediately see the technology there. That's always an easy one to immediately mark. Um, guiding my students in checking their learning. Anybody want to talk about where you, which categories you see that matching? Technology and relationships? I definitely think relationships for sure, um, because we have to connect with them to show them the importance and, and why it matters to check our, our learning. Um, we're also connecting with them. Um, I would assume that it's not just so they can go in there and see their they're poor or their job well done grade, but to keep that conversation um, on where their learning is and what they need to do next. Remember, PowerSchool is sort of the after the fact. That's our student information system um, of record. It has all of our EMIS grade re reporting, attendance, um, but grades are entered in PowerSchool when something's finished. Schoology, I feel like, is more of the living area where an assignment has context and relevance and meaning. And so I can look at what's um, coming up in my Schoology gradebook, especially if you use due dates, it, it organizes beautifully. But then I can look at that assignment in the context of what is it saying I need to do, where my confused are lost. So that's why we wanna use both of those. They need to understand their summative grade, where they fall in the school year. But in Schoology, that's sort of where the, where the assignment lives um, and it can be accessed before the grade is done. So, in what I just described, I firmly feel that's a pedagogical practice. I mean, we are helping our learners understand their learning and where they are and where they need to be. 
All right. Anybody have um, a opinion on curriculum content, why that should either be checked or not be checked? Don't make me say Bueller. <laughs> and I don't know if Mary Bueller's in this one, but that's hilarious to me if she is. No, okay, she's not. <laughs> All right, so for me, my grades in my grade book and my activities in Schoology had better for the most part be connected to our curriculum and learning goals, right? I mean, we wanna create assignments based on our curriculum, um, based on what we want our students to learn. So that's a statement, in my opinion, that hits all four categories. Um, it, it's possible somebody could feel different, but I, I'm just gonna share that opinion. All right, to jump ahead, because we only have 10 minutes left and I wanna get questions answered, I'm going to just um, pick, I'll go right to the middle. Um, I'm going to go with um, number three. I create different response options for students to demonstrate mastery and express themselves within a task. Verbal, written, video recorded, project-based, et cetera. So there's no limit on this statement. It's got ideas for different response options. So in my assessment practices. I create different response options. Okay, my response options, let's take a look at this for a minute. Um, my response options for them to demonstrate mastery is certainly a pedagogical statement. That is the science of teaching and learning. Um, how I instruct and I create a response type gives my, ch uh, my students options, um, that's a pedagogical practice. There's definitely technology implied if they're going to do video recorded, um, but that was really the only one that called out technology specifically. So just keep that in mind. Not everything in stage two is super he tech heavy, but because it says video recorded, I'm gonna check technology. Now, when I look at the response options for students to demonstrate mastery, okay, what are they mastering? They're mastering curriculum content. Um, but it also says, and express themselves within a task. Well, that is that heart, that's relationships. If my students in my classroom feel that they can express themselves, their thoughts, their ideas, their wonderings, um, maybe their arguments, their disagreements, then I have established good relationships with my learners. All right, so that's another one that hits all four of those areas. Instructional practice statements. I'm gonna randomly pick another one. Um, for this one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with number eight. And that was, whoops, I'm in the wrong box. Ah, where is it, where is it? They're not numbered in here. But also too, you wanna read them. Let's see, there it is. All right, I select and use curriculum-based digital tools to enhance learning concepts. And then it gives you some examples. For example, Desmos in math, Gizmos in science, or news, uh, ELA, Newsella, depending how you say it, in various subjects. Well, the very beginning of this statement tells me curriculum-based, so boom, that's an easy one. Digital tools, boom, that's technology. To enhance learning concepts, well, I as the teacher have selected and used to enhance the learning concepts, that's pedagogical. And do I do that in order to uh, establish relationships? I don't know. I would hope as a teacher you're making your decisions based on your own students, but does this statement explicitly imply relationships are built? I would actually say, in my opinion, it probably doesn't explicitly refer to relationships, so I would leave that one off. You can definitely see how many of these are subjective. So again, this reflective exercise for you here in selecting those boxes is just that. But you'll note in your submission of evidence rubric that it is expected that your evidence submitted reflects all or most of the areas checked in the template. And it even is a little bit, um, there's some wiggle room. Maybe it's hard to demonstrate those relationships, but you know it, um, there's a teacher at SANS, Tracy Cummings, but you know it in your knower that you establish great relationships with this activity, but it's difficult for you to prove on a, on a statement. Don't worry, nobody's gonna ding you if one of these, you have a box check that your evidence isn't directly tied. As long as most of them are directly tied to what you categorize, you'll get your two points on categorization. 
All right, guys, we are at 2.54 and I am grossly behind on my agenda because I spent way too long unpacking the statements. But I wanted to intentionally unpack the stage two statements. Um, that's why I call this one stage two skills by looking at what does the statement mean? Um, what, what areas or categories does this hit? Is this technology, pedagogy, content? Um, and that very important one, relationships. The reasons why I capitalize this is um, you'll often see like the TPAC model. The actual acronym means technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. Uh, we have an amazing partner at UC, Sarah Schroeder, who redefined the A instead of and. They really just put it in there to make it readable, I think. But uh, she called it affect or the effective relationships. Um, but like I said, you know, it was it was early in this work. Um, our manager, Don Williams, called out, where is the heart in this work? So relationships, we feel, as I'm sure you all do, are, are the heart of why we're doing the work we do and really the only way we're going to be successful in our work. I'll encourage you if you want to learn more about looking back at the Distinguished Educator Deeper Dive, I have that recorded on my YouTube channel. I want to make sure... Um, because we did this more open communication style and, and I got some feedback, I hope your questions have been answered, but I'm gonna stop talking, pull your contact link, and allow anybody who wants to unmute and ask a question to go ahead and do that. Um, I have a question in regards to the read and write. Mm -hmm. So how do you access that? Perfect question, and I've got a resource for you I'm gonna share now. Okay. Um, so Read and Write is a Google Chrome extension. It is for purchase, and we have purchased it district-wide. So that is a really important statement in and of itself. We have made the investment that this is a, a critical tool. It is a universal design for learning UDL tool. Uh, Text Help is a UDL-focused company. And this extension that they created has a rich toolbar for, um, it's, a, it's an assistive screen reader, but it's so much more than that. It also has a writing component, so it's actually got writing supports built in. Um, there's vocabulary enhancements in there. Uh, it also has two, um, two complementary tools that are approved but not pushed out district-wide. So when you sign in and sync to Chrome, you will access Read and Write, in your extensions bar. And then um, you uh, should add the screenshot reader and the PDF reader if you really wanna get into full accessibility. Um, but what I'm gonna share with you now is a link to a presentation that I did last week with Joelle McConnell. And um, that is the full hour PD on read and write for the stage two distinguished educator. It would really be good for anybody, even if you're not in stage two yet, um, the district has purchased this. So um, how to access it and how to use the tool is all in this video. The information at the bottom of the screen below, if you look at the information down here, this link takes you to the chat transcript, the agenda from that PD, and the feedback form. So that's a perfect little segue into me sharing your feedback form now. Um, this form is what you complete to ensure you get your contact hours. Um, if you don't need contact hours, we'd still love for you to complete the form. Uh, if you need the contact hours, you must put in your employee ID number and first and last name. If you don't need the contact hours, you can always put an NA in there. That used to be an optional box. I'm still not sure why it was changed. Um, your role, uh, you put that in. The topics that we cover today is the Distinguished Educator Program. We looked at a couple of things, but that was, that was pretty much what we covered. Put your school or schools that you work at. Today's date is July 14th, and this was a 2 p.m. session. The type of training, if you're here with me now live, you joined a virtual PD session. But if you go onto my YouTube channel later and you're watching this, you viewed a recorded virtual PD. So to, um, to the uh, educator who just asked about Read and Write, if you want to watch the video, um, you can follow along with that PD. Um, it's mostly presented by Joelle. She is our district guru, uh, really in all things Google, but especially Read and Write. So we co-hosted this session together. But you can access um, the chat transcript, uh, the agenda, and that feedback form. So you can you can participate and just mark viewed a recorded virtual PD session. Uh, 30 minutes to one hour. 
My name is Rosemary Jane. You do the feedback section of this form, add any additional questions or comments that you want. Keep in mind those should probably be around the specific PD or the virtual PDs in general. If you have a specific question for me, I do ask that you reach me on Google Chat, which you can access in your Google Apps menu right here, or just going to chat.google.com and search for my name in the upper left field. All right. Marie, that's okay if all of this is new for you. That's why we have ongoing PD. Um, I did not go as much into my look back at the uh, Distinguished Educator Deep Dive, but guess what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna link that video for you now. Uh, it is here. There it is. So I will put that link to the video in the agenda since we didn't get as much into it. If you did not attend last week's Deeper Dive, you could uh, also view that as a recording. And again, the, the feedback is, um, if you guys are doing this in your own time off a recorded PD session, we want you to earn credit, or I should say contact hours for the time that you're spending. So that's why viewed a virtual PD recording is on there. Um, all right, I gave you that link. And then this will be um, linked after I process this video that we're on right now. That's a wrap at three on the dot. Oh, I'm never usually that good. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, if there are no more outstanding questions, then I'm gonna end the recording. Lori, you're welcome. If anybody wants to unmute, if you have a quick question or, or so, 